<sighs> Anyone wondering why I'm wearing a coat? Other than that, glad to see you're sitting up front again today. Because <laughs> we're here for a funeral. That's why we're here for a funeral. You know, uh, if things are going to live like a seed before it becomes a tree, it has to die. You know what I mean? It's got to go in the ground. It has to cease being a seed so that it can become a tree. And so as we approach Easter, which we celebrate the new life, we know that Jesus goes to the cross, and three days later he rises from the dead to offer new life. And it's the same for us. We get new life. And that's why anytime anyone gets baptized here at this church, you'll hear us say that I now bury you with Christ, and like him you'll be raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. So Jesus goes to the cross so that there can be some new life and as we come to the cross, we are reborn. We have new life, you know? And so Jesus says this. He says that he came that you would have life and have it abundantly. You'd have it to the full. You'd have a good life. You know what I'm saying? He said, I came that you might have good life. The scriptures also tell us that if anyone is in Christ, the old is dead, right? And, and behold, a new man, a new creation. Someone new. There's new life when you come to Christ. Well, here's the thing. We come to Christ. We say, yeah, I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. Forgive me, Lord. And he does, which is amazing. But sometimes we don't experience that abundant life. Sometimes the life that we have as a Christian is not much different than the life we had before we were a Christian. And so this is the thing. For the next three weeks, before we celebrate this brand new life, we got to kill some things. We gotta kill some things. We gotta put some things to death. There's things in our life that are in the way of us having an abundant life. It's all right there. Jesus gives us all we need to have an abundant life, but there's things that are in the way, and so we're gonna kill some stuff. And this week, we're gonna kill Jesus. Now before you throw something at me, I wanna tell you we're gonna kill Jesus with a small j. What I mean by that is that there's things there's images and, and, and assumptions about who Jesus is, who Jesus was, that are not true. It's not who he is. And we're going to go through some of those things today, and we're going to kill some of these Jesus so that we can know the real Jesus. And so that we can live the abundant life that he came to give you. Who would like to experience, by a show of hands, an abundant life, all that Jesus would have for you. So this is an appropriate message for her. She's got two hands up, right? You can raise a foot if you want to. I want that too, Harry. There you go. I want that abundant life. I, I want to I be able to, I want people to, to walk down the street and just like feel something coming off of me. You know what I mean? I wanted to see something, look over and, and see a glow about me. Remember when, 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 when Moses come down off the mountain, he was glowing. I want people to see that about this Moses. I want to see it about you. I want, to see it, I want them to see it about you. Some of us bald guys got an advantage, but some of you have hair, sorry. And so you're going to need to work a little bit harder to get that glow. Amen, Greg. Yeah, look at it, it's shining right there underneath that light. It's the transfiguration going on right over there. You walk by Greg, you take your shoes off. It's holy ground. All right, let's talk about a couple of things. Just a couple of things that we want to put to death. And that's why this is here. We're going to put some things to death today. All right, here's the first thing. We're going to put to death earthly warrior king Jesus. Okay, we're going to put him to death. This is not who Jesus ever was supposed to be, okay? But that was the popular belief system back in the day. <laughs> I didn't make this graphic. That is online, okay? I am crazy, but not original. Someone came up with that. Rambo Jesus. But this is, this is what a lot of people think of who Jesus was supposed to be. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Back then, okay, th there's... there's they're, the Jews, who are now, a lot of them are becoming Christians, okay? The early church, were, they were all Jewish people that had, that had been converted. 
Now, they're living under, it happens to Jewish people all the time. I don't know what it is about us, but they find themselves in slavery and oppression to Egypt, and they just don't learn. And so here they are again under the oppression of the Roman Empire. So Rome's going around, and they're conquering nations. They're conquering people, not with love and truth and things like that, but with the sword. Right? They're going there, they're raping and pillaging villages and just burning stuff and killing people. This is what they do. And all through the Bible, if you read the Bible, you see that that's, that's the mindset of the people back then in, the, in those days. They'd have a king, they didn't, people didn't like him, what they do? They just kill the guy and bring in a new king. And it was just an ongoing thing. And you see throughout not just this history book, the Bible, but in a lot of history books, if not all history books, that, that's what happened these nations would just be at war all the time. I want your land. I'll come kill you for it. They didn't reason. They just see something they want and they take it. And by force, by sword, that's what they did. And so that was the mindset of the people. And you can see that running all through Scripture. Let me start here with you. The reason why people thought he was going to be this earthly warrior king who was going to come like the Romans did in every other empire and every other nation beforehand, they came with the sword and took things by force, right? And so this is what they thought would happen. Rome's got us oppressed. Well, some, this Messiah's coming, and he's going to rescue us. And like everyone before him, he's going to come with the sword, and he's going to conquer Rome, and we're going to be freed. The Messiah has come. We're delivered. This is the mentality of the Israel, of the Jewish people. Look for a second in Psalm chapter 2. I'm going to be giving you a lot of Bible tonight. I hope you're appreciative of that. It's the best dinner I could possibly give you. Psalm 2, just the first couple of verses. This is the mindset of the Jews back in the day, speaking of thinking and speaking of this Messiah, this one, this rescuer, this deliverer who would come and free them from the oppression of Rome. Psalm 2, here we go. Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. I love this. This is good. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne of Jerusalem and on my holy mountain. So you can see just from this text when you read this, there's this, there's this battle mentality that this Messiah is going to come and by force he will set the people free. He will set the people free. It follows this context, this concept in Scripture where every nation has a God and every time God's people fight against those people, it's our God against your God. And, and so our God, if, I, if we win, that means what? My God's stronger than your God. And you can read in the Scriptures actually time and time again, the people will say, you know what? We're, we're, we're fighting for the Lord. It's the Lord who's going to win the battle for us. So if we win, he wins. And we prove to these people that our God's the real God. Whoever the winner is, their God is ultimately the winner. And so these battles are to show whose God is the strongest. Now, this mentality is, shows up in, a, in the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was written some seven to eight hundred years before Jesus Christ comes in the flesh. And he's right, and this is the most uh, clear messianic prophecy in all of Scripture. It speaks clearly of this Messiah that will come. And if you look in Isaiah chapter 11, my, Isaiah chapter 11, the, just the first four, vor, four, first four verses, more force, more battling. This Messiah will come and conquer. Listen. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. Listen to this. 
The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. Again, he's coming with force to set the people free. And that's what they think is going to happen. They think he's going to be an earthly warrior king, much like Rome was, by force to set them free. And then you, you jump over to Isaiah 53, which is the clearest messianic prophecy in all of Scripture. Isolated 1, verse uh, 12 of Isaiah 53, it says, I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier. This is the mentality and the mindset of the nation of Israel and the Christians who think this Messiah is coming to set us free by force. That's what they think. Now, this mentality trickles on down through the times. Seven, eight hundred years. Jesus goes to the cross. And this Messiah that was going to come by force and set his people free is now dead. Well, that'll take the wind out of your sails if you think he's about to take the nations by force and set us free, right? The guy's dead. So this is what happens. In Luke chapter 24, there's these dudes, these disciples of Jesus, and they're walking down the road. And they'd seen what happened to Jesus. And they're talking about it. And all of a sudden, Jesus, now keep in mind, he was dead. He shows up. That's power, right? He shows up. And he starts talking to these two dudes. They're walking down the road, talking about what's, ha what's happening in Jerusalem. So if you go to Luke chapter 24, do that for a second, because I never want you to think that I'm making anything up. As a matter of fact, if you don't have a Bible, there's plenty of them, right? See these orange ones, Jared? Every week, man. It's like having an another kid. <clears throat> I love you. Luke 24. Candy, can you find it for him? I don't think he reads real well. Welcome back, Cotter. Luke chapter 24, verse 21. They're talking about what happened to this Jesus, right? He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. It's like game over, right? And this is what their next statement is. You can see that mentality of the Jews. Verse 21. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. So you see the wind just come right out of their sails? We had hoped, in other words, there's no more hope. It's done. They were kind of depressed. You know, he wasn't the warrior king that they had thought he was going to be. So the question is this, is he really a king? See, they thought maybe he's not. They had lost and they were defeated. Well, do me a favor and go back to Luke 23. Luke 23 shows... Jesus go before Pontius Pilate for his so-called trial to see if he's guilty of something. That was a joke. But here in, in chapter 23, right at the beginning, then the entire council took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. They began to state their case. This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes with, well, if you've read the Bible, that's a big fat lie, right? He says to pay. That's a lie. And by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? Now, I have a modern translation, and in here it says one thing, but in my translation it just says, Jesus replies, yeah, yeah, you know it. I, I don't know if yours says that, but it says it in mine. And, and he says, yeah, you've said it. Yeah, you, you, I'm a king. I'm, he doesn't object to the fact that he's a king, but is he a warrior, earthly, take it by force king? Well, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, if you look over in John chapter 18, Jesus Christ himself tells you just the king that he is. So I can't possibly make up anything better than this. This is what he says in John 18, 36. My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. You see... That's what everyone thought. And Jesus agrees with them. Listen, if I was an earthly king, like your Roman Empire, I would just come and we would kill you all. But that's not the way it's going to happen. He says, it's not the way it's going to happen. I am a king, but it's not a king of this earth. It's a king that's 
not of this world. Look further. Jesus continues in verse 37. So you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. So like, he is a king. But this is what he's going to say. This is what he says. All who love the truth recognize what I say is true. So, see, he is a king, but he's not a worldly warrior king who's going to come and rescue his people by force. See, the tools of this battle are not the sword, and they're not the gun, and they're not the Apache helicopter. They're love. They're truth. They're not the sword. And so what we need to do is we need to put to death warrior king Jesus. Okay? That's not who he was. That's not who he ever will be. Let's move on. The next one, this is, a, this is funny. I find this one to be very, very funny. A lot of people melt this Jesus down. I don't, I don't even know what to say. They melt him down like it's no big deal. And they, they say, well, and, and I'm Jewish, and so I, I, I used to think this, and, and most Jews, I, I, I would venture to say, believe this to be the case, that when you ask them who Jesus is, now remember, they don't believe in him, and he's Jewish. I mean, he was a rabbi, and he was a carpenter. That's what we know. And so when you ask the Jewish people, what do you think about Jesus? Their normal reply is, well, he's just this good moral teacher, which I think is hysterical. I think it's hysterical. And let me tell you why. Let me start here. In Mark chapter 10, verse 18, someone says this to Jesus. They say, good teacher, and then they ask a question. Now, Jesus doesn't jump on that guy and say, hey, whoa, 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 I'm not a teacher. He, do he doesn't say that. He does say this. He says, why do you call me good? And there's a lot of theology in that. We could study that another time. But see, he never objects to the title of teacher. Jesus never objects to the title of teacher. However, that's not all he is. Do me a favor. Go to Matthew chapter 7. See, he doesn't object to being a, a, a teacher at all. He is a teacher, but he's not just a teacher. He actually claims, and I'm going to give you a couple of different uh, verses here, where he claims not only to be a teacher, but a really good one. Okay, a really good one. Um, he says this in 724. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a, rock on the, uh, a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey, it is foolish. <clears throat> like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Like before, this has a lot of theology in it. But for our argument, our discussion tonight, look at these two things. Jesus says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, it is wise. He also says in verse 26, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. So what is he saying? I'm a good teacher. I'm a very good teacher. So he doesn't knock that claim that he's a teacher. Look also in John chapter 5, verse 24. 524. It's a pretty sound, those Bibles. Turn in those pages. 524 says this, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. So these two verses, those, these two sections of Scripture, what are they telling us? What's Jesus himself saying? I am a good teacher. Now he did teach good morals. Yes, absolutely. He did teach about anger. And he did teach about adultery, and he did teach about divorce, and he, and he taught us about revenge and how not to take it. He did teach us about giving to the needy. He taught us about financial stewardship. He, he teaches us to pray for our enemies. He tells us to, to love our neighbor. Now that is good morality, would you agree? So he's a good teacher, and he teaches good morals. For sure, he did teach high morality, yes, but he also taught this. John chapter 14, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
Now, now in this room, that might not be shocking, but remember something. He's talking to a bunch of Jewish people that believed in this God that they had never seen that was so powerful and strong that if you stepped foot onto Mount Sinai, you were dead. You didn't come into his presence. You heard thunder. You saw lightning. The, rum, the earth was rumbling. This is the God. And they all believed in him. And Jesus is going, yeah, I want you to also believe in me. I want to lift myself up to that level. And they're probably just freaking out, right? Freaking out. But he didn't just teach, you know, be nice to people. He said, I'm God. I want to put myself up there with this unseen God that you had known for generations who split the Red Sea open, who created the earth. I want you to put me up with him. That's crazy. That's crazy. So he taught good morals, but he also taught that. He also said this, I am, the, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to that God that you've never seen before. No, I am him, and no one comes to him except through me. Okay, so, so here's a freebie for you. We had a couple things that we're going to throw away, right? We're going to put to death. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I want to put this to death too. Is it up there? We'll put this to death. The one of many choices, Jesus, lowercase j. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I want to put this to death. The, listen, he, the, it's, the, the gospel's open to every person on earth, but it's very, very, very particular. He says, listen, you can't just believe in a lot of nice things. You can't be religious. You can't have high morals. You can't just take my teaching and say, okay, I, I, you should be nice to people. Okay, that means you get to go to God. No, 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 no. He says, no, there's one way to God, and it's Jesus. And here's the thing with Christians. I'm stealing this from a pastor friend of mine. I'm waiting, and he's waiting, and I would love to hear one day when someone has the, the spine, when someone says, why are you a Christian? They don't say, well, because the Bible is, because they go, because it's right. That's why. Because it is the only way. Jesus is the only way to the Father. He's the only way to get to heaven. Stand up for what you believe. If you can't say that, you don't believe in it. There's only one way to God. His name is Jesus Christ. So we need to put to death this one of many. It's not a multiple choice. So let's put that to death too, okay? Let's put that to death. Let's move on. He also says this. This is bold, man. He says, all these years you've been worshiping this unseen God. You've been talking about this God that was present with his people since the, the Garden of Eden. Listen, if you've seen, this is Jesus talking, not me. He says to them, if you've seen me, you've seen him. That's cr Can you imagine the spine on a man who would say that unless it's true? He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So you can't, listen, you, you can't say that he's just a, a good moral teacher. When he's saying stuff like this, he's insane, or it's true. He goes on, John chapter 4, the, 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 let me give you another one. This is when he's talking to this, this woman at the well. And, and he says this, he says, um, he says, the location of worship is not really that important. See, some of you guys, you worship on Mount Gerizim, and some of you worship in Jerusalem and all that stuff. But listen, that doesn't matter. The time is now when you have to worship the Father in spirit and truth. And there again, tons of theology in that. But we don't want to talk about that. But this is what I want to say about it. Jesus says this to her, and the woman says this to him. Hey, I know that the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he'll clarify all this for us. He'll teach us what all this means. And Jesus, not on what Bible you have, but Jesus looks at her and says, I am the Messiah. He says, I, this is the, this is, this, he says, I am the Lord. He steps it up. Jesus always steps it up a notch. He's not just the Messiah. He's the Lord. He says, I am the one. Here, in some translations, I love this one. This, is, this takes a spine like a redwood. He says, she says, the Messiah will come and he'll teach us these things. And he says, the I am is here. That gives me the creeps to even say that. You know what I'm saying? That's crazy. You know, you remember when Moses is going to, 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 to Pharaoh to, to set the people free, and he's like, God, you want me to go send, set them free, and you want me to say, hey, God said to, to come and get, rescue you, you know? And they're going to ask me, what do I tell them? Who, who should I say sent me? And, he, and this voice says to Moses, tell them the I am. I am that I am. That's who sent you. And Jesus says, 
I, the I am is here. I'm him, right? That's not just like a good moral teacher, you know what I'm saying? That, that's not a good moral teacher. See, a good moral teacher wouldn't lie or deceive people on the most important topic that there is to the human race, eternal life. See, no one claimed John 3.16 of Jesus. Jesus said, that's a quote of his, that God so loved the world that he sent me. So if you believe in me, you have everlasting life. That's what Jesus said. And he wouldn't lie about that. If he would lie about that, then he is not a good moral teacher by any means. Okay? So, so if, 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 if he would lie about that, then, then morality is completely out the window. Like if it was just the, you know, teaching people to be nice and take care of the poor and feed the hungry and all those nice things that we should do and we should, if that's all he did, then yeah, great, good moral teacher. But if you say you don't believe in him and he claims to be God, then he's a liar and morality is out the window. Do you guys, are we connecting here? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so, so if good morals and good teachings are shot then you can't call him a, a good moral teacher. I wanna, you guys ever hear of C.S. Lewis? You know who C.S. Lewis is? I wanna read you what he said, okay? I wanna read you what he said. He's um, way smarter than I am. He's the guy who inspired the uh, Chronicles of Narnia and he wrote the Screw Tape Letters, just an amazing author. Um, and this is what he says. C.S. Lewis was a professor at Cambridge University and once he was an agnostic and he understood this issue of calling Jesus just a good moral teacher. He understood it clearly, and this is what he said. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. That he's, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. He goes on to say you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. That's not an option. That's not an option. So, we need to kill. Jesus is a good moral teacher. That has to be put to death. <clears throat> now, here's the next one. All Christians believe the Bible. Christians, I put quotes around Christian. All Christians believe the Bible and they use it to teach. However, some Christians have a false identity slapped onto Jesus. And I'm not here to rip on anybody. Everyone has the right to choose whatever they want. But there's a popular group in our world called the Jehovah's Witnesses that believe that Jesus was created. Okay, so this is the next thing we're gonna put to death. We're going to put to death the created Jesus, okay? The created Jesus. The Jehovah's Witness will teach this, that, God, that, that God's first creation and his greatest creation was Jesus Christ. They also teach that, that he only became the Messiah at the moment he was baptized. That somehow he was just a man, and the, but at the moment of his baptism, when the Holy Spirit descends upon him, only them is he anointed and becomes the Messiah. Okay, we're going to put that to death right here and now. Now, now listen, I wasn't there. I, I, I haven't spoken to Jesus. I didn't write the Bible. But you, I'm telling you right now, and you'll know this by, by the time we get done, you cannot read this book and come to that conclusion unless you are a lunatic. There is no possible way and I stand on that and if you don't like it that's fine tough this is uh, this is the Bible okay and, and listen I, this is the NLT you can read NIV New King James King James American Standard whatever all these regular old Bibles you cannot read this book and tell me that God created Jesus and that his anointing only came when the Holy Spirit fell on him that's not that's not the way it is okay let, so let's let's put some things to death let's let's start here 
Go to John chapter 1. This is this very, very clear. It's very, very easy. John chapter 1. Let's put to death this, this, this created Jesus, okay? John chapter 1. Love this. He says this. In the beginning, the word already existed. Now, I've, I tried to, to explain that a couple of years ago, and I still don't know how to now. I think over the years, I'm hoping that I'm getting a little bit smarter. I hope we all are. But I still cannot explain to you well what already existed at the beginning means. See, to us, we're trapped in time. Okay, how old are you? 24 years old. So 24 years ago, there's a certain day and a certain moment that he started, right? See, so, so, so we all think in those terms of that there's a beginning and then there's an end and then in between there's a timeline, right? But, but this says that at the beginning, so say, let's say 24 years, we'll use my birthday, March 28th, 1969. So on that day was my beginning, right? Would you agree? Okay, but, but, but this says that if Jesus had a beginning, that he already was, so it blows the beginning right out of the water, right? It doesn't make any sense. So in the beginning, before anything was, or if you want to be technical and say, well, he means before creation. Okay, fine. Maybe it's before creation. Before creation started, he already was. Either way, it's a win. Either way, it's a win for God not being the creator of Jesus, but that Jesus already existed. And I don't even know how to explain that, but it says that in the beginning, the word already existed now we know what this word is because on chapter 1 verse 14 it says that this word became flesh and dwelt among us that was jesus this man god who came down and put on skin and he and he lived here so he says in the beginning the word already existed the word was with god and the word was god again don't ask me to explain that right don't ask me to explain that I can't say, you know, I'm with Pete and I already, and I also am Pete. Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? Well, that's what's happening here. I'm, I'm, I'm with God and I am God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, it said that nothing was created except through him. So how could he be created since he's the one who creates everything? Does it make any sense? Are we connecting here, right? You all make, you understand what I'm saying, right? Okay, so let me give you some more. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. My favorite section of the Bible. You can't say that Jesus is a creation when the Bible says in verse 15 of chapter 1, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created. Can you say duh? Right? Come on. You can't say he was a created being when the Bible itself says that he existed before anything was created, is supreme over all creation, for through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we could see, the things we can't see, thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything, everything was created through him and for him. He created angels, he created stars, he created you, he created water, he created every single thing. Jesus created it, so you can't read this book and say that Jesus was a creation. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Biblical Christianity claims that Jesus was not created, but was the creator, which makes him what? Deity. That makes him deity. He is God. And uh, yeah, like he's a, he's a teacher and he's a good teacher, but he's also a king. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This is Jesus Christ. Now listen, I don't want you, you don't have to go there, but in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, he, this, is, this is Jesus again. He says this. He says, I am the source. Jesus says, I'm the source. I'm the thing that this thing, I'm about to tell you what it is, that this thing came from. 
I was the energy. I was the creativity. I was the ability. I was the source of David. Now, if you read history, David precedes Jesus. Do you, do you understand this? We've got David in the Old Testament. We've got Jesus in the New Testament. So chronologically, just on time, who came first? No. David did, right? However, Jesus says, listen, I haven't shown up yet. You know nothing of me. But Jesus himself says, I am the source of David. And I'm also, this is the crazy thing, I'm the source and the heir to his throne. So I was before him, and I'm going to be long after him. This is Jesus Christ, before and after. Oh, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. Does it make sense now? And then this, he goes on to say this. He says, not only am I the source and the heir of David, but I sent my angel to give you this message. Now let me ask you a question. How many people have angels on demand in their back pocket? They say, hey, go over to the crust over there and tell him to do this right now. See, I can't do that. The president can't do that. Billy Graham can't do that. Nobody can do that. You, get, you know who's got Jesus? You know who's got angels in his pockets that he can send to go do stuff? Jesus Christ can. He can send angels because he's deity. He's not a creation. He's the creator. And he says, I am the source and I am the heir to David, and I send my angels to give this message. None of us can do that because he's not a creation. He's the creator. He's the creator. Jesus has angels on demand. Now, people back in the day, and, and even now too, um, they struggle with Jesus' deity, and, and, I'll, and I'll show you why. Um, over in uh, Exodus chapter 20, all the way back into the Old Testament, almost the beginning of the Bible, if you go there. Exodus chapter 20, very, very famous section of Scripture. It's the Ten Commandments. You guys heard of that? Yeah, Bailey, 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 Bailey. Listen to this, you ready? Exodus 20, verse 4. You must not, this is God talking, he says, uh, you must not make for yourself any idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other lowercase g gods. He said, just to understand this clearly. He says, other than me, don't make anything up. Don't come up with something creative that you think I might look like, okay? I am God, and I don't want you to take anything that is created and bow down and worship to it. You guys get that? This is the Ten Commandments. This is a biggie, right? This is even before he says, don't lie, steal, and cheat, which is, you know, the biggies to us, but before that, he says, listen, I want to make something clear. Before you decide to, to follow me and not lie, steal, and cheat, I want you to understand why. I'm God. I'm the creator of the universe, and you need to understand this. And there's no other God except me. I'm it. Uh, over in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is this famous, famous uh, Jewish prayer. And, and I don't know much Hebrew, but uh, I want to tell you what it is. And, and I've come up here before and I've, I've, I've said some things in Hebrew and I told you I don't even understand what it means. But I used to go to temple because my parents would make me go. And I used to hear these prayers over and over and over again. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. I used to hear that all the time. Every week they used to do this thing. It's called the Shema. This is what it means. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. That's the prayer. And they say it every single week. And so the people of Israel, and then of course the new Christians, they couldn't comprehend the fact that this man could possibly be God because the scriptures have been telling them since day one, there's only one God. I've never seen him. He's a consuming fire. He's an unapproachable light. He shook Sinai and we couldn't even walk up on the mountain. That's the God who's real. This guy cannot be God. And if you bow down to him, you have to pay the consequences. It's not good. It's not good. God doesn't share worship. It's a table for one. As a matter of fact, we see how he responds to people accepting worship that's not theirs. 
It's over in Acts chapter 12. This is New Testament. King Herod. Powerful king, right? I don't need to tell you what's going on. You can read it. Uh, It's Acts chapter 12. Read it at your own time, your own convenience. But the people want to gather up around him. And it says the King Herod put on his robe, his, his royal robe, and he got on his royal throne, and he started to speak. And the people are like, this is not the voice of a man. This is the voice of a God. And they worshiped him. And because he didn't say, whoa, stop, instantly God struck him dead because he took the worship that was his and his alone. I am the Lord. The Lord is one. You do not bow down to anything except me. So you can see he's pretty serious about worshiping other things, right? You get this? He strikes the guy. He's, he's, he's in, our, in our area here, we say he's ate up with worms. He's ate up. He, he's ate up with worms and the guy dies just like that. God's like, no. You, you, no, no one worships anything except, or anyone except me. I'm, I'm God and, and God alone, okay? So this is why the Jewish people and the new Christians even, they don't, they're not getting all this that this guy's like, God? Like, it doesn't make any sense because if someone worships other than, then, then die, and this guy died, and he, you know, so they're scared. They don't, they don't like to, to think that something could be deity other than this false thought that it's just this unseen. It's not this man. And so let me show you something. Um, Luke 24.50. Look there. That happened in the Old Testament. Look in 24.50. Jesus goes to the cross and he dies. And they bury him. And he raises from the dead. I'll just give you a context verse. 49. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Verse 50, then Jesus led them to Bethany. Now listen, this is the resurrected Jesus. This is the dead man who's now alive. And it says here, Jesus led them to Bethany and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken to heaven. So they worshipped him. They worshipped him. Wait a minute. God says you don't worship anyone except me. Did, any, did God kill anyone right then and there? Did, did those people fall? Did they get ate up with worms or anything like that? Anyone die? No, as a matter of fact, it says after they worship him, they returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. It was a good day. They did the right thing. Let me, let me give you another example. Uh, Matthew 28, 8 and 9. It's awesome. Again, Jesus rises from the dead. He rises from the dead. And in in verse 8, this is what it says. The women who had gone to the tomb, they quickly ran from the tomb. They were frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. You can study that. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. Remember, this is the dead guy who's now alive. And they ran to him grasped his feet, and worshipped him. So, 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 so this guy, King Herod, he accepts worship, and God strikes him dead. And here's this Jesus, just a man like Herod, right? He's accepting worship. No problem. Everyone's filled with joy. Good. It's all good news. Everything's fine. As a matter of fact, if you look in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, God himself orders his angels. He says, let all the angels of heaven worship him. He tells the angels of heaven to worship Jesus Christ. So we need to put to death this created Jesus. Let's do that. So Jesus wasn't a warrior some warrior king sent to conquer Rome by the sword and set Israel and these new Christians free by any means. He was, he was a wonderful teacher of high morals, but not limited to that role by any means. He's not part of a multiple choice on getting to God. And he certainly wasn't a created being. So that's not who Jesus was. That's not who Jesus is. But let me just tell you who Jesus is. Jesus is God. 
And at this church, you know, some of you guys go to other churches, that's fine, you do whatever you want. But at Revolution Church, hear me clearly, Jesus Christ is God. Okay? He is God. Yeah? You can clap for him. It's cool. <clears throat> I'll tell you why. He's eternal. Remember in John chapter 1, in the beginning, he already was. He's eternal. He's also creator. John chapter 1, 3 and 4, I read to you. Everything was created by him. Colossians 1, 15 and 17. Everything was created by him and for him. He's eternal. He's a creator. He's also the forgiver, the only forgiver of sin. Uh, in Mark chapter 2, verse 7, these religious leaders, they say a lot of things in the Bible, but they say a lot of stupid things. But one of the only things they said that was absolute truth was this. Only God can forgive sin. And now I think everybody can agree. Like, I can forgive you, you can forgive me. But eternally and for heaven's sake, if I forgive you, it doesn't mean you're going to heaven. You know, I have no pull there. It's not up to me. So only God can forgive sins. Can we all agree with that, right? Well, here's the thing. You know why they said that? If you go to that section of Scripture, in verse 5, he looks at the guy lowered down through the roof who's paralyzed, who's coming for a, for a healing, and Jesus looks at him and says, man, this guy needs a deeper healing than just paralysis. And he looks at the kid. He says, my child. Now, hold on a second. My child? My, was, that this, was that Jesus' kid? No. So how could he call him my child unless he created him? Okay, that's a freebie. So he says, my child, your sins are forgiven. <gasps> Only God can forgive sins. And he says, your sins are forgiven so they're freaking out. They're freaking out. He's claiming to be God. Luke chapter 7, verse 48, same thing. Jesus forgives the immoral woman that pours the perfume all over him. He forgave her. And these religious people are freaking out because he's doing something that only God is allowed to do. This is Jesus Christ. So not only is he God, but he's the Savior. Jesus is the one and only payment for all sin. Look at Rome. I want you to just see this with your own eyes. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. Yet God with undeserved kindness declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. Not one of many, not once, and you got to keep doing it, as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Done. Hebrews chapter 10. Here's some more. I'm just going to give you some bullets for your gun. Hebrews chapter 10. Go there, please. Read it with me. Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 10, 12, and 14. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Verse 12. But our high priest, Jesus Christ, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Verse 14. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Do you get it? One sacrifice for all sins for all people. It's available to you. Jesus Christ is God. He is eternal. He's creator. He's savior. He's the one-time payment for your sins. That's it. You don't need any other religion. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to go see a pastor or a priest or some rabbi. You don't need to put money in a plate. You don't need to dress a certain way. You could do whatever. That's not the point. The point is this. If you want relationship with God, there's only one way to get it. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. And that's it. Jesus Christ, he is our friend. He is our big brother. He's our sustainer. He's the lover of our soul. And he's the head of the church. And I wonder, do you know him? Do you know him? 
Do you know him? The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduring strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is lighter. I wish I could describe him. For yet he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him. And you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him. But they found out they couldn't stop him. Couldn't find any fault in it. Terror couldn't kill it. Death couldn't handle it. And the grave couldn't hold it. Yeah! That's my That's my I'd like to invite the gentleman up to come up, give communion out. We're going to worship Jesus. But as they're receiving these elements you can go ahead and you can take a few moments of, of quiet time with with Jesus I'll come back up and we can take it together as a family if you'd like and if you want to take it before then that's fine but go ahead and give that out while you're doing that I want you to think about this I told you a lot about Jesus tonight I told you about what the Bible says about Jesus you saw what this man, in this video, this preacher said about Jesus. Jesus asks Peter in the Bible, back in the book of Matthew, chapter 16. He says, what do people think about me? Who do they say I am? And he goes and he tells them what the people think. And so you could tell people what I said, or you could tell people what the Bible said, or you could tell people what this video said. But Jesus doesn't let him off the hook that easy. He says, I, okay, I get you. This is what they said. But let me ask you a question, Peter. Who do you say I am? And, and I want you to think about that because I, I can stand here with complete sincerity and tell you that 
the answer to that question is the most important answer you will ever give in your lifetime. It, it, it makes all other questions mean nothing. If you don't get this one right, all, other, all bets are off on everything else. So take a moment and decide for yourself who Jesus is to you. Thank you.